This morning, as I said, we have a, a, a man who is going to be our speaker. He has three parts to his uh, presentation. Uh, the first one, and really the question is, are we really in the last days? Uh, Dr. Christian Widener is from Rapid City, South Dakota. He has a degree in mechanical engineering. He worked in industry for some time. He also uh, taught engineering classes uh, at, uh, at South Dakota. And so uh, his passion, though, has been prophecy, studying the end times. Uh, how he actually got connected with us is he, he and his family uh, were in Israel and uh, met Steve Johnson and his family. And that's how, again, we, you can say by chance, but really it's by God's appointment that the two got together, uh, met, and so when we started putting this to program together, uh, it all, it, it worked again by God's divine appointment. So uh, again, it's just been a joy to, uh, to meet Christian and work with him, a uh, very humble man with a lot of experiences. So uh, we please, please welcome uh, Dr. Christian Widener. So it, it is a sober topic. Thank you for inviting me. Are we still good on? Does this sound about right? Um, I'll, I'll just tell you um, sort of my basic background. I was raised in a Christian home. My mom got saved really when I was you know, a toddler and was discipled by, maybe that's a little too loud or a little bit? No, good. That's good? Okay. Um, was discipled by a, a, a Bible teacher, kind of a theologian kind of guy who taught her how to really dig in and study the scriptures, how to look, do word studies and things like that. So I, I grew up in a, in a home that really studied the, the Bible and, and, could, and had extra reference materials to look at. And so that was kind of just something that, um, that was in the home that, that sort of, you know, started me off on a, on a good path of really digging in and trying to understand um, the scriptures. And we, we attended solid churches most of my life, so that, that was a pretty good, um, a pretty good footing um, to, to kind of start on. But then didn't feel God calling me to ministry and felt like I was supposed to just go work. So I went to school, got a degree in mechanical engineering, and I started traveling around um, fixing power plants. <coughs> and that's how I met my wife, and um, and that from that came uh, these four beautiful children that you've you've probably all had a chance to see. Um, but that was I was in a job that traveled 11 months out of the year on the road, and so that's not the kind of job you keep when you're married. Um, and so instantly started looking for something else, went back to school and started getting a master's degree. Um, I thought maybe I would, you know, just get up a little bit more education and I could move into something that was more sciencey and researchy. Um, as an undergrad, I'd done a summer at NASA and done a, a research project and I really liked that and I thought maybe I would go back to that, but I'd have to go back to school. So I did that. Um, got hired at the National Institute for Aviation Research, which is on campus, and now I'm getting paid to do research, and so that led to getting a PhD and moving in. And all this time, um, though I started while I was at the university, you're interacting with students. And so then that creates this opportunity for sort of for apologetics and also for studying prophecy, which was something that, that I'd always been interested in. Um, we started leading Bible studies and teaching and, and trying to really explain at, at a deeper level what some, of, what some of the prophecies meant and some of the reasons to believe. Like, you know, how do we know that Noah really, you know, was real and that he built an ark that actually held all the animals? And I don't know if you guys have ever, you know, some, so I know some people here have been to, like, the Ark Encounter. And to try to see, like, hey, does that math really work? Could you really get all the animals in the world? And 
and I would, you know, I would get challenged by things like that instead of going, on, well, I, I think so. I would just, I, I, well, let me see if I can calculate that. Um, so that just kept leading to sort of deeper and deeper digging in on my own um, because I wanted to have an answer um, for those kinds of questions and I wanted to be able to share that with people who also had deep questions that were interfering with um, in their mind for them to surrender their heart to Christ because that's really the, you know if it's just an intellectual debate it's not it's not important um, but it is important if if there's something that's that's really holding someone back from I just don't think that's true and if I don't think that's true then how can I believe in it so I, w I wanted to be able to give answers for those kinds of things and I wanted to know in my own heart that you know what I was believing was sound and so that, that that's how I kind of got into and I started going to prophecy conferences and I wanted to talk to the speakers I had questions or things that I was thinking about um, but the further I got down that rabbit hole, the more I started finding things that I thought, hey, nobody's talking about this. And then I would try to talk to people at conferences and, and introduce ideas, and I found it pretty difficult to introduce a complex idea in a short sort of interaction and talk, and um, eventually felt like the Lord was leading me to, to write. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how, um, and I got here, and I, I probably skipped some of these slides, but um, I was a university professor for eight years, so um, I'm definitely not a professional speaker, so sorry guys, um, you know, you're going to get some kind of lecture uh, type thing, and, but I'm just a very factual type of person. I want to convey information without a lot of drama, you, hopefully you guys appreciate <coughs> that part. Um, and, uh, but just to let you know that I, I did do some things that, um, that just, I, mean, I, I hate to throw these up here, but it's, it's like, I'm going to tell you some things that other people aren't saying, and how do you know that, that it's just not my own kooky ideas? Um, and, and that's just, you know, uh, through doing some of those things, I think I know how to tell when something's solid and real, and that's why I'm sharing. If I didn't think that this was reliable, just like Howard said last night, you know, you who teach others will be held to a higher standard, I also feel that. Um, I feel a big responsibility to, to cry wolf if it's not really a wolf. So um, I think there's really a wolf, and I think these are the last days. Um, and, and I'll, I'll finish explaining why. But I've written two books in the last few years. Uh, the Temple Revealed, um, which was about where the temple is really located, because I thought that when you look at scripture, one of the big signs is that there would be a temple rebuilt, uh, because it says that um, the Antichrist would set himself up in the temple of God and declare himself to be God. And that temple of God is not just, he's going to set himself up in a temple, he's going to set himself up in God's temple. Hmm, well where's that? Well that's in Jerusalem. Yeah, but where exactly? Um, so that's what the first book is about, and both of these books are on the back table, um, and there's uh, more books and boxes underneath the table, so I'll make sure I pull those out at break. Um, and then, uh, witnessing the end. And those are free for you guys to take, um, so, uh, they will be. They will be back there. Um, is there anybody here that needs me to tell you that something is wrong in the world today? <laughs> um, probably You're only using singular. Yeah. Um, Many. So, without thinking about Bible prophecy and just looking at what's going on in the world around us, um, there is a paradigm shift that's in process that we can see and it's just common sense um, you know 1984 was a you know ridiculous idea uh, maybe 40, 50 1984 came out I don't know 48 was it 40? 
48. 48. So, you know, that was a long Awfully time ago here. that we're like, what? The, the means to do what was talked about didn't really exist back then. But what, the, what exists now with technology does give the government who wanted to the ability to control a lot more things than they've ever been able to control in the past. And you go, what's going to restrain that? Just, you know, the, the goodwill of man and, you know, that internal restraint. And you go, uh, but that's, that, that's not what the sin nature tells us, right? Sin nature tells us that somebody's going to abuse it. And history teaches you that even somebody who won't abuse it, somebody's going to come kill that guy and he's going to replace him. So from a how long can we continue to, to invent the technology that we have um, and have all these tools in place before some strong man comes along to be able to do that? I don't think there, that's an infinite runway. It's just sort of a general sign that I think we've gotten into a time that unless you took away that technology, eventually totalitarianism is going to rise because the only thing that would restrain it is, is the goodness of man and oops, that's not something that's real. Um, of course, God can restrain those things. Why didn't Hitler take over the world? Why did he make some of the dumb mistakes that led to his downfall? I think because God took wisdom from him and didn't allow him. So God has always been restraining evil um, and can continue to do so. But that would be the only force that's going to work against, I think, what where we've now arrived in history. Um, and I'm sorry about the, um, the technology glitches. Um, we are in a time where good is evil and evil is good. That's, uh, you know, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And that's, that's a time like now. Abortion, transgenderism, critical race theory, wokeism, communism, fascism, tearing down America, vaccine, mask, and lockdown mandates. I never thought I would see that. You guys probably never thought you would see the kinds of uh, abuses of individual freedoms that have occurred. Um, loss of the biblical worldview, paganism on the rise. I mean, open paganism uh, in ways that I just, you know, I thought would be a joke that people would really start trying to worship the old gods again. Like, but you, you see a lot of that. Um, apostasy in the church, widespread fall of church leaders and ministries, and the perversion of justice, and the loss of constitutional rights that you, you don't, you know, there's, there's all kinds of examples of um, violations of the law that aren't being prosecuted. Um, I used to do a lot of work with the Department of Defense, and I always avoided getting a secret clearance or some kind of, you know, to be able to look at classified documents because there's a ton of responsibility and liability when you get into that, that world. You could be, you know, arrested or charged for just one violation of a document. And yet, you know, there's some famous examples of people having all kinds of classified documents abused terribly and, you know, what happens? Nothing. Well, we know there were all these violations of the law, but no reasonable person would try to, you know, bring a case against, you know, one of America's elites. Um, and and that's, that's a time where justice is no longer, right? There's two, a, a, a dual system. So we, we are in this kind of time. And, and it's bad here, but it's much worse other, many other places in the world. So that's the other kind of thing, like, you know, for it to really be the last days, it can't just be an American thing. It has to be a global thing. But I think you can say these same kinds of things around, around the world, um, and that it's finally also infecting um, America. So 2 Timothy, what does uh, Paul have to say? But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. 
Um, these are hard words, and I think they fit fit our times. Um, this one, disobedient to their parents. I used to think like, yeah, okay, so. But what's interesting is this is happening globally. And you try to think back into a time in history. There was one thing that's almost always been sacrosanct is that children had to obey their parents. And that could be China, under Buddhism, or India, or America, everybody, that was the parents of the, are the law. But in these last several decades, as we've got you know, the internet and international communication, we've got movies, um, a lot of movies that you know, Americans are making, that have started to change that culture worldwide. And for something that was said 2,000 years ago, I go, wow, that's actually really significant. That's, it's not a small thing that children all around the world are starting to suddenly diso disobey their parents. Weird. Um, almost like, you know, it was prophetic about these times. Um, and having a form of godliness but denying its power. I mean, how many places do we see um, sort of a, you know, a general adherence? In fact, it's one of the big objections that people will make about Christians is, yeah, but they're a bunch of hypocrites. Um, or things to that effect. Now, a lot of times that's a dodge, and it's also an acknowledgement that we're still sinners. Right? I still mess up. I'm not always the man that I, that I should be before God. Um, but, you know, as a mature believer, I acknowledge that when I mess up. And I say, oops, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, honey, to my wife when I answer harshly and I should have been more kind. Right? I owe her that because I haven't lived up to God's standard, which is, you know, to love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not proud, it does not boast, it keeps no record of wrongs. Like, that's a tough list. But as Christian men, we're called to always love like that. Um, and when we don't, we, you know, we say we're sorry. And I think when we do that, we're not hypocrites. We're just still sinners, right? Where you're a hypocrite when you sin and you won't acknowledge your sin, right? You won't repent. You won't acknowledge you did anything wrong. Um, but but you do see a time of of general, you know, churchiness um, as sort of a, a recognition of, of God in some you know way, but it's not transformative. It's not really. They're not living and, and obeying God. Um, and something about you know have nothing to do with such people. It's it's tough. How do we love uh, the sinner but hate the sin? How do you keep good company so that you're also kept on the right path? How do we call others you know, out um, to live a more godly life and, and to leave you know, these things? Um, it requires discernment. It, there's, there's a time to, to minister to people and there's a time to separate from people. And there's not an easy answer for that. But I think Howard's right. We definitely need to be sure that everything that we're doing is in love. But there has to be wisdom, too, about what kind of relationships we're in, especially in these days when there is a growing divide within the church of um, people who are, are going to continue to surrender their lives to Christ. They're going to be ready for the bridegroom and for for people who are, are going to actually look for more and more of a worldly definition for what it means to be a Christian. But something is very wrong. So here's George Orwell, and of course he would have had to have written it in the 40s or at least before 1950. Um, but war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that is going out. Um, today, and it's a time of deception. There is not a lot of wisdom in the way things are being handled today. How are we getting into this big inflation? How do we have an Inflation Reduction Act that will do anything but reduce inflation? Um, you just put the opposite name on it, a Child Protection Act, and it's not for protecting children. Um, we are in a day that, that is, um, but have we seen these days before, the American Revolution, the Civil War, World War I, Great Depression, World War II, um, I would argue that those were definitely traumatic times, 
but they're not like today. Um, and, and I don't think today is done. So I don't think you can compare this moment today because I think next week or next year, right, there's going to be um, more to say about that's bad than, than, you know, all of a sudden we're pulling out of this and, and, getting, and getting better. Um, and if we look back to times like Nero, which was also brought up last night, um, you definitely have some, that was a peak of evil in, in the world, but it's also back to a biblical time. So we're talking about now, for comparisons, we're looking all the way back to the last time that Jesus was here and, you know, the apostles were on the land. Um, <clears throat> another thing that's going on is, um, I call it rebuilding the Tower of Babel. And I would say that we are again at a Tower of Babel time in human history. And you could ask, you know, how so? Well, what we're doing is building a tower of technology that is geared towards making man God in, in a humanistic um, vision. So transhumanism, humanism, how do we make ourselves more than what God made us? How do we give us ourselves superpowers um, is, you know, is a push for science today. Um, artificial intelligence is, is coming. It's not really fully here yet. I, I, would, I would say that we're a long ways from computers truly taking over the world, despite some of the sci-fi. Um, but there is a lot of amazing programming that's being done, and there is real artificial intelligence that's being done to learn. In fact, I was just saying the, the Witnessing End book's now been translated into Spanish. Um, we're refining that, but it was translated using Google Translate. And, and I'm pretty sure that's an AI engine that drives it. Five years ago, it was terrible. But today, it's really good. So, and I, my Spanish is decent, but not great. My wife, though, is impeccable. And she's like, yeah, that's, that's a good translation. Um, and that's just in five years that, that their engine has caught up and started to become really, really good. Um, and that, that is thanks to, I'm sure, AI. Uh, cybernetics, cloning, medical, medically altering uh, gender, deleting aging from our DNA. That's a, you know, a lot of people are convinced that the aging is a, is a little switch in the DNA and that if we can go in there and figure out how to alter it, um, that we could turn the switch off. Because you realize that you're, you shouldn't be older than your oldest self in your body. You should just be able to, that old cell should just be able to replace itself in a new cell. And we should just be able to keep replacing cells and be basically young forever. Why aren't we? Well, because there seems to be some code in the DNA that just starts dialing back our ability to do that. Almost like God put a limit switch, right, in the code, which he did. He did. He said, you know, this is it. I'm going to let you guys go this far and no farther, I think. Um, in Genesis, it says, I will limit man to 120 years. And a lot of people wonder what that phrase meant. And was that, did he say that 120 years before the flood? Um, yes, he may have. But I think it also means that man's not going to live more than 120 years. And if you look... There's, I think, like one person that's debated whether they actually got older than 120. And even in that, there's, it's suspected that, that she was um, using her mom's birth certificate to, to claim to be 120. Um, but out of 8 billion people on the planet today, there's really nobody who's over 120. 118, 119, that's it. So that's a pretty good data set to say, no, man's limit really is 120 years. And so when I see that, and I see a, a, a verse in scripture, and then I see a, you know, a good data set like that that goes, yeah, no, 120 is our limit. I go, well, it may mean other things, but I think it also definitely means that we're not going to pass 120. But you know, if, you're, if you don't like that, and you don't want to believe in God, then you might you know, be bold enough to say, hey, I think I can figure out how to turn that switch off. And you know what that is? That's really, um, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were thrown in the garden, right? What happened next? 
they, they were they were kept out, and who kept them out? You guys remember? Some angels, yeah. Fiery so so why? So that they couldn't enter back into the garden and take from the tree of life and 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 then live forever in a sinful condition. There was some real thing that God said, nope, not gonna let you do that. So do you think he's gonna let us by some other means sneak into the garden and you know genetically make our own, you know, uh, fruit for the tree of life? No. He's not if if he blocked the Eden, so we wouldn't do that. He's not going to let us do it here. But we are getting close. Right? That's, that's unique. That's something um, that hasn't happened in history before. That puts us in this really sort of unique time. We're building this tower, and it's getting close to heaven. Is God going to let that continue? I don't think so. And um, one other thing about the Tower of Babel, everybody spoke the same language. And one thing that started really hitting me as I was going around giving talks on uh, advanced metallurgy and, and materials processes. Wherever I went in the world, I was given that talk in English. All the peoples of the world were coming to those international conferences, and what language did they have to get their presentation in? English. So we already have, in science, this Tower of Babel is already in English. If you're not doing your work and it's not published in English, it almost like doesn't count from an academic perspective. So, so we already have one language. All the great scientists of the world can speak or read English. Weird. But it's like the Tower of Babel all over again. Um, so the reliability of prophecy is another, another key. Remember this, keep it in mind, take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. I make known the end from the beginning and from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. And I, I love this verse because we know that what God has said, he will do. And it's always right. We can't always perfectly guess how he's going to do that. But for sure, everything he's got in mind, he's going to do. And he's given us lots of clues to study and try to figure out. So I, I don't think it's, you know, um, it's, it's not impossible, but it's hard. And we have to be humble that maybe it won't happen exactly the way we, we imagined. But, but the idea that he's going to have told us what he's going to do, just keep looking. Um, I'm going to explain this. When we start to see those things, I think it's important to, to recognize it. Um, and the, the cover of the book is this amazing painting by I think Hans Memling that's John's Revelation. And so I, I like it because it, it has the four horsemen here and people hiding in the rocks and the caves. Uh, a great angel who stood in the land and the sea, a lot of the images um, from, from a revelation, a woman clothed with the sun, um, those are things that, that are images in the book of Revelation that he captured. Um, but John's told us a really good revelation of, of what we should be looking for. It, it goes along with the Old Testament prophets. And when you start putting all those things together, there's just hundreds of verses that are telling us what, what to watch for, and, um, and and they look like what we're looking at. So it, it behooves us to, again, be prepared, which is the, the theme of this conference. Um, it's also our blessed hope. So we, I look at these things because this is what, what I'm hoping for. This is our... Um, this is our promised reward for all the things that, that we go through in life. You know, there are believers today that are suffering terribly, that are being killed for their faith. And, and what's their reward? Let's see. Um, is that the Lord's coming back, his reward. So the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. And all about this hope purify themselves. Um, 
sorry, uh, purify themselves just as he is pure. And that, that's about, you know, getting ready, getting the sin out of our lives, and, um, and really trying to, um, you know, help warn others, as well as prepare our, ourselves and our families. Um, this has always been our, our hope. And because of that, the church has been looking. Um, I to fix that right now. I'll work on it. Um, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only me, but all who have longed for his appearing. And so we want to cultivate um, that longing for his appearing. But the love of this present world and sin is at war with that, with that longing. Try just adjusting the, the, nothing may happen, but try just to make sure it's plugged in tight. It might be losing that connection. Um, but one of the things, and, and it came out in Howard's talk last night, he was there when Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, first came out. So when you think about that, you know, we're in this time also where the church has been saying, hey, the Lord must be coming back soon for 50 years. And a lot of people thought it was going to be, you know, 50 years ago. Because there were signs starting to show. Um, there was the book, 88 Reasons Why the Lord's Going to Come Back in 1988. And, you know, it definitely wasn't in 1988. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all our hopes have been disappointed because these times is now, though, different. And, and I like to think about it. Um, if you've had kids, if your wife's had a baby, um, there's this time that leads up to that. You get some contractions, and, you know, sometimes... It's like, oh, yeah, maybe it's starting, and they run to the hospital, and no, nope, it wasn't time yet. And then, you know, but they get some other close contractions and run to the hospital, oh, nope, no, it's not the time yet. Um, but you go, at some point, just because that you had a, a few false alarms to the hospital doesn't mean the baby's not coming. It just, you know, wasn't quite yet. Um, but, but you're in that, all those signs are telling you that the baby's still coming really soon. Um, and I think what you could say is, if you've ever driven a long ways towards the mountains, you start seeing them on the horizon, you go, hey, look, we're there. Especially if, like we used to drive from Kansas to Colorado. So you've driven a long ways without seeing anything. And then suddenly you see something on the horizon, you think, yeah, we're there. And then, you know, you're driving for another 30 minutes, right, or, or whatever, an hour, and, oh, there they are. Nope, we're still not there. Each time, though, they're getting larger and larger on the horizon. But, but you, could, you could have easily sort of, you know, felt like, hey, we're there as soon as you see them the first time. And I think what we've seen, the signs that were seen 50 years ago, they're just bigger. They're more. It's... You know, they're more in abundance. It's even more clear than it ever was before. And so you could say, well, I don't know. Maybe we're still not quite there yet. But I think what's happened is we're getting now, the mountains are looming so close on the horizon that we can say, yeah, no, we really, all this time, we've been driving closer and closer. And now I think we, you, at some point, you can say, yes, we were right, or we are right. Um, and I, I think that's where we, where we are. But there are some very specific things, and there's a whole list of them. And, and just because you got a few of them, you know, that would, that was, those were starting to indicate that we were getting there. But now we've just added to the list. So that Israel would return to the land. Huge. Um, but the world would look like the, the days of Noah before the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, that's been true for a long time. But if you look at like the acceptance of homosexuality, which was one of the big signs of Sodom and Gomorrah, that's been coming for more than 20 years. But how much has it grown in the last couple? Right now, you can um, you, 
you can be fired because you posted that you think marriage is between man and a woman at, at a lot of companies. Um, that's, <clears throat> that's a big change in a very short period of time to really turn that on. Um, the birth pains, nations raging against Israel and Jerusalem. When, when I think that um, between you know, 25, 2700 years ago and 2000 years ago, it was prophesied that the nations around Israel would be raging against them. And you think, well, yeah, because they were in that day. Okay, but, but that that's still true 2,000 years later? That's amazing. That they still have the same enemies, that the same drama is playing out 2,000 years later, 2,500 years later? It, it really is, is remarkable, and, and we're watching that. You know. And the specific countries are named. And those today are, are countries that are enemies of, of Israel. That there would be a special treat, uh, peace treaty. And then the return of the Jewish temple and sacrificial service, which is, again, is why I wrote the, the first book. Um, and and the, the purpose of also looking at these things is because of this parable of ten virgins. And at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, whoever took oil in jars along with their lamps. And the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. And at midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both us and you instead go and sell oil and buy some for yourselves or go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves but while they were on the way to buy the oil the bridegroom arrived the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut and later the others also came lord lord they said open the door for us but he replied truly i tell you i do not know you therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour and it's a super, I'm sure most of you know this, you probably know it very well. Um, but there's some big lessons from this. Everyone fell asleep. So, so that there's no, the wise ones, the foolish ones. There was something that happened to the church waiting 2,000 years. Right? That it's just, okay, you know, it was a long time. And, and there was a, a period of time where they just needed to worry about living their lives. Um, also, all the ten virgins look the same. So when you talk about wheat among the tares, um, or, or this idea of being wise and foolish, they're all together, they're all the same, so this is, um, this is a, a sobering call to the church. And oil couldn't be shared, just like faith can't be shared. Right? Why can't they share the oil? Because the oil represents like our faith, it represents the Holy Spirit, but it represents something that you have to go get for yourself. You have to do the work to recognize these things. Um, that the witnessing the end book that I that I wrote is 400 pages long, and you know th there's there's no shortcut to learning these things. Like that takes time. It takes study. You have to think about it. And I really try to make it as simple and clear. Um, as I can in the book, I, I'm not trying to be, you know, I'm, I'm shooting for, you know, the for every every person who wants to understand it, but also wants to know, you know, where that evidence can be found. Like, how do I know that's true and reliable? But but it will take um, work. But I promise, if you get through that book, you will feel like you you understand a lot more about about where we are um, prophetically and, and why those things. Um, are important, but at some point also it was too late. And, and I think about as we're approaching these days, there is a time when there's just, you know, there's either too much deception in the world that just, you know, can't get through it, or just not enough time to study and learn the things that are needed to, you know, in the Word to be prepared. So, um, the, the 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 purpose also of the book is to to give a warning when there's while there's still time um, to to do something and for people to learn. But um, and 
half of them miss the bridegroom. So half of the virgins who thought they were waiting for the bridegroom weren't ready and didn't go in. That's to me that's very sober. Um, and what does it mean missing? I think me missing means going through the rest of the judgments of the tribulation. Um, but it says, I never knew you could be, you know, not saved, right? But I, I, I tend to be more positive. There's a time coming in the tribulation that says, anyone who wants to save their life will lose it, but anyone who loses their life for my sake will find it again. So I, I think there's still, still time, but there will be dark days. And so the whole left behind, I, I think that's a real, I think that's a real thing. I just not sure that the time is exactly right. So, watch therefore, be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for the master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can be immediately open the door for him, and it will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he, when he comes. So, this is a real direct, sober, like Jesus expects us to be ready, to be watching, and to be waiting. But one of the other sobering things when we look at, at the first coming of Christ is that here's the Messiah. He's talking to the religious leaders of the day who know the prophecies, and they don't recognize the Messiah standing in front of them. That would be like us knowing that the prophecies, knowing that the end is prophesied. So a lot of people know that Revelation is about the end day at times, and yet might be watching what's happening and not recognize the connection between the two. Might not recognize that we're in times like what, what's prophesied for us to watch for. And yes, that happened to the Jews, but I think the lesson is that that can also happen to, to us, right? To anyone. Um, and so, could we also miss the signs of his return? Um, so, one important thing is there were no neon signs in Jesus' day saying, hey, the Messiah's here. CNN didn't cover it, you know. There was none, there was no official sort of announcement that was indicating people were expected to know the prophecies, to see the man, and connect the two. Um, so, and there were prophetic signs, but they were missed or, or forgotten about. Because remember when Jesus was born, there were shepherds who announced it. But it was just a few shepherds, right? It was just in one little area. Um, there were wise men from the east that came to announce it. Now one funny thing, um, so the first time it's coming was announced by wise men from the East. And I would say that now you have again, and, and I, I don't, um, I'm not pointing that at me, but there's wise men from the West, right? Who's talking about Bible prophecy? Who are the scholars about Jesus' return? They're in the West. No. So that's kind of, it's a little poetic. Um, there was Simeon and Anna in the temple who recognized, and they said in the temple, "Oh, this is this is the Messiah." So, did did they forget, or did not enough people hear? Did they not believe? But but why didn't they know the Messiah had been born when it was announced in the temple? And there were prophets who said it. Um, John the Baptist, who was declaring, you know, uh, make way uh, straight the way for the Lord, and then he goes, "Oh, there he is!" When Jesus came. Um, Daniel 77, which we'll talk about um, in the next section, uh, the miracles that Jesus performed, and then all the messianic prophecy that was, that was there that was fulfilled in his life. And fulfilled by many of the people who were <clears throat> actually didn't believe he was the Messiah, and yet they're fulfilling a prophecy, like dividing the the soldiers didn't, you know, cast lots for Jesus' clothes because they knew there was a prophecy about that happening. Right? But they did. They fulfilled scripture. So as they're doing it, they're demonstrating that he's the Messiah. And yet, you know, they, there was one, though, who did, right? There was a centurion who saw all these things and said, surely that was the Son of God. So there, there were people who, who even saw what happened and testified. <clears throat> and while we're, we're talking about we might miss these signs that Christ is coming back, of course, nobody is going to miss the the sky opening up and Jesus coming on the clouds with power and great glory. But that moment will be won't be missed, but it, it will be um, it will be too late to you know 
to get your your ticket for that bus. So what's what's missing is it does take faith to recognize prophecy. It really does take faith to see what the Bible, to read what the Bible says, see something happen, and they go, you know what, I think that's a fulfillment. There's, there's a leap there that has to be made. Otherwise, we default to, well, yeah, it does say that, but I don't know. That's kind of, a, could just be a coincidence. Maybe that's not really fulfilling scripture. Like, that's not really a fulfillment. That's a disbelief response. A faith response is like, oh, yeah, it says that he would bring his people again and bring them into one nation again in the last days, and that happened. Seeing that and connecting those takes faith. Um, Abraham believed God and was credited as righteousness, and without faith it is impossible to please God. Um, this one, I don't know if you've thought about this, prophecy is a sign for believers, not for unbelievers. It's in the context of speaking in tongues and other things, but it's, it's clear you have to be a believer or prophecy because you have to read what he said and you have to see what happened and you have to believe it and connect it um, and do not treat prophecies with contempt and, and uh, that's all too common um, when you start talking about prophecy that yeah but you know lots of people have lots of ideas and, that, and that's true they do but, um, but there has to be a reliable truth out of prophecy and that's what kept me sticking to it is I'm like, yeah, lots of people say lots of things, but the Bible says exactly what it wants us to know, and that's reliable. And so yeah, I don't think people are reliable, and I don't expect you to, to think that everything that I say is right without testing it. Um, but you can be sure that the Bible's always right. I'm sure the Bible's always right, and that as, that's grounds me in, in my study. So the, the, the big... First sign was now learn the lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. Now, if that's not true, if we're not supposed to see things happening and then know that summer is near, then how, how can we know anything? And how can we, we guess? But if we see these things starting to happen, then we should recognize by the words of Jesus, that it's true. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. There, there are two challenges to that interpretation. Is Israel really the fig tree? That's an inference. I think it's a good one, right? But it, it's possible that that's, that's, that that's not right. But I, I think it's right. And, and right now we're testing that. Um, because Israel's a nation again. So if the Lord doesn't come back within some definition of a generation, then yeah, that's not a true interpretation of that verse. But, but I, th I think it is a, a good interpretation of the verse. In the book, I go through um, a lot of, I, I list a lot of the verses that, that you can reference that help you see a connection between Israel and the fig tree. It's, it's not a absolutely 100%. It's, it's a, I think it's a good inference. But... Um, but I, I think it's important to, when we use these verses, to recognize that we're, we're assuming that's what that means. Um, and some of those assumptions you know, are going to be right, and some of them may not be right. But when is the end of a generation? But literally, it's, it's clear what it means, that, that this generation is going to see these things. But which generation? Not the generation of Matthew's day. The generation that sees these last days. Um, and so what is a generation? Well, there's several possible definitions. The Israelites had moved about in the wilderness for 40 years until all the men who were of military age, which in other scriptures defined as 20 years or old, uh, 20 years old or, or more, when they left Egypt had died since they had not obeyed the Lord. And our days, Psalm, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. And then the 120 years, the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever. For their mortal, their days will be 120 years. So there's some possibilities here. 40 years, 60 years, because it was 40 plus 20. 70 to 80 years, or 120 years. And then what's the reference? What's the budding of the fig tree? Um, who's ever heard of such a thing? Who has seen things like this? Can a country be born in a day, or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than she gives birth to her children, Isaiah 66, 8. 
That's an amazing verse because it's literally in a time when countries were only won by a warfare. Right? You didn't have a United Nations that could, you know, give permission to a country to declare independence. That's not a concept that existed in um, Isaiah's day. But modernly, you go, oh, yeah, of course you can just declare a nation. That's possible. Um, but that's exactly what happened. And it was 19, May 14, 1948. Um, there was something significant. June 7, 1967, they reunited Jerusalem in the Six Day War. But that wasn't the birth, that wasn't the budding of the fig tree. So I don't think we're talking, I think we're talking about this first first day, that's when Israel appeared. Um, and that gives us some windows. So plus 40 years is 1988, hence one of the reasons, you know, 88 reasons it's going to be 1988. That didn't happen. 60 years, 2008, that didn't happen. We are now in this 70 to 80 years. That's 2018 to 2028. That's an interesting window given the other things that have happened beginning in 2020. And so later I'll talk about why I think 2020 to 2027 is a significant seven year window that we need to pay attention to, but it falls within that. And so, you know, what you'll see as I go through this is I'm, I'm looking for independent testimonies from Scripture. And, you know, here's an argument for a time period and a reason that's completely separate from another one. And do those all line up and tell us the same thing? Because um, there's a principle in Scripture that says you shouldn't believe anything unless it's proven by more than two or more witnesses. And I think there's a lot of things in Scripture that God internally also testifies in multiple places of the same thing so that we can corroborate and, and kind of know something's right. Um, the next window, if it's 120 years, might be 2068 to test that idea. But I, I don't think that's, I think this is the one that's being tested and I think this is the one that's going to prove out. I could be wrong about that, but I, I there's, there's a solid sort of theological or argument for why that might be what Jesus meant. Um, Israel regathered in the last days. Then will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover his hand the second time. The remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and the islands of the sea. Um, and so the first regathering was in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, 516 to 409 B.C., but this phrase, like, I don't know how many people have noticed that there's, like, I will do it a second time. And when was that? That was our time. That God regathered the Jews from all those places into their land. That this would be the second time. That, that means we're in a special time. This is really unique. And, and to find those kinds of testimonies that this would be twice, um, I think, are, are very important. Um, again, you know, God will defend this is what the Lord says when I gather the house of Israel from the peoples where they are scattered and demonstrate my holiness through them in the sight of the nations then they will live in their own land which I gave to my servant Jacob and they will live there securely build houses and plant vineyards and they will live securely when I execute judgments against all their neighbors who treat them with contempt then they will know that I am Yahweh their God so you know, again, testifying that not only would they be brought back, but their neighbors would be against them, but God would defend them. And I don't know if you know all the history. Many of you probably know the history. They, they declare uh, their independence in 1948, and they're immediately invaded, I think, by five armies. And they have no standing army of their own. Absolutely should have been wiped out. But nope, somehow, miraculously, they survive. Um, 1967, they invaded again. They went and they called it the Six Day War because they literally defeated all of the surrounding enemies in six days. Yom Kippur War, again, you know, they're determined, they bring the, the thousand Syrian battle tanks. It's one of the, they, they hate to study the, the Golan Heights invasion by tanks because it was so few Israeli tanks that were underpowered by comparison and they still defeated, you know, stalled and defeated the, the Syrians. Um, 
all of those have these miraculous stories about how they should have been defeated but weren't. Clearly God was, was fighting for them. And when we think that Ezekiel wrote that 25, 2600 years ago, and that that was fulfilled in this you know, final generation, again, another big, oops, that's must be something special. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem and he gathers the Israel's exiled people. A thousand BC. But, you know, here's a picture 1898, here's 2011. Israel's being rebuilt before our eyes. So do we recognize that, that God said it would happen and, yep, yeah, it's happened. Then the nations will know, the nations around you that remain will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt what was destroyed and have replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. So God wanted this to be a sign to the nations 2,500 years ago that we would see this and we would recognize that that's his hand. I'm the one who's done it, right? I've rebuilt what was destroyed and I've replanted what was desolate. And some people will go, yeah, but the Jews don't, you know, most of them don't even believe in God. But that doesn't matter. What matters is that God said he would do it and, and it's happened. Um, and then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. So, you know, will we see the temple and will people recognize the rebuilding of the temple um, as the Lord's work? Will the nations recognize that as a sign? I, I think so. Um, and in some ways, you know, the, the, the Temple Mount is still there. The place is still known. So it's still among us. That's still holy ground um, because God said it was holy. Right? There is no house that can contain the Lord, but, but in Jerusalem, on the Temple Mount, is the place that he said, this is where I will place the soles of my feet and my throne. So it, it's important because God said it's important. Um, and so I will show my greatness and holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations, and then they will know that I am the Lord. Another verse about as these things are happening, we, we are to recognize that it's God's hand at work, um, and it's a sign to, to us and to the nations. So um, there's a lot more on the significance of Israel and the very, very specific prophecies of fulfilled in chapter 4. Um, and just literally over and over and over, you can see that, that God has said that this, that this event that we've watched would be significant, specifically how it would happen. Um, and that's probably the overall, I think, biggest thing that tells us, okay, this is the time to be watching. Um, and then we'll, I'll start taking some questions and we'll, we'll get into uh, more, but that's, that's, that gives you kind of a, a first pass at, at why I was, I was seeing a lot of this stuff, why did I start looking even more is because of, of those things. And specifically, I was working on the temple location because I thought that was the next, the next big piece. And then out of that came even more specific prophecies that I thought started pointing to the, the temple. So how about um, some questions and then and some discussion? You can also, we could finish, follow up on some of the stuff discussed last night, um, whatever you guys, you guys want. A question about artificial intelligence. Um, I was watching, I think it was pretty good on Fox News, uh, that there is already a robot that has, you know, instead of a sentient thought, it identifies itself, understands itself, uh, realizes what, you know, that, I, I mean, I know that there's a lot of ways, programs you can incorporate all that stuff, but they're saying that. Some somebody from Google has created this, and so I that it was kind of shocking. But we need to be aware of that that there are some other forces working. Here. Yeah. Um, so there's still like a lot of research being done on <coughs> developing those those codes. 
Um, but what, what I think that that's more of an illusion than it is real, and, and I'll say why. Um, because it's, it does have a good AI engine, and it can interpret from what's going on, and it can answer what looks like intelligently, because it has access to an enormous database of sort of natural communication. And because of that, <clears throat> it can sort of interact and respond. But it's using a database of information in order to be able to make those responses. So I think it makes it look more clever, but that's different than um, an AI, for example, that could come up with a new invention. Right? There's a big leap before, before I can, like, as a robot, I could stand up here and you ask a question, and then in the context of everything that's happened, it can pull and make a reasonable response to that question, versus, you know, now that it can go study the Bible and it can come up with some new insight, right? Or it can go and invent some new, you know, farm implement, because it's, cre uh, that true intelligence, I think, still weighs off. But what about the possibility? Sure that maybe this is actually a demonic force that would be able to use the electronic. Because I've noticed that, you know, I've been praying that your equipment would work. Okay? Oh, yes. You know, I mean, I've been doing a, it's like there are times where I say, God, why is this happening right now? Yeah. And is this something that maybe a demonic force is actually? Control because we don't really understand the inner workings of computers and stuff. And what's right. actually happening? Yeah, and so to what degree could could demonic <laughs> intelligence interfere yeah. in in our world as we certainly they have the ability um, in the past demons had the ability to you know appear as people um, and I wouldn't say that they don't have that uh, ability anymore but it, but whatever abilities they have are constrained by God. So they're only allowed to go, like, you know, God had, Satan had to go ask God for permission to, to do something to Job, right? He can only do as much. So um, I think they have all kinds of constraints on them that God places and limits that wouldn't necessarily be their limit if, if God allowed them to do whatever, right? So, so I'm not sure where those limits are. I think it's okay to pray, um, for our battles not against flesh and blood. I just, a lot of it's hidden from us, so I, you know, it's hard to know. It seems to me that it's, it's becoming more revealed in the last, these last few years. It's right. what is really going on spiritually. Yeah, and, and one of the things that happens in the time of tribulation is that um, his restraining hand is removed. And, and a lot of people wonder what that, who's the restrainer, how does he restrain? Um, I, I would say that uh, you can never um, take the Holy Spirit away from some place. It's like God's presence never leaves. But his restraining hand absolutely can be removed. Um, and so I, I, don't, I don't see that as um, the, I mean, I see it attributed to the Holy Spirit or to, to God, but, but not in, like, really leaving. Um, but just... Uh, We've had so many storms, a lot more storms in the last couple of years, and a lot more right. earthquakes, a lot more you know, pestilence. Lot. Yeah, plenty of signs. And I think when, when we get into the next session, there will be some concrete reasons to start going, oh, okay. Um, but, but in a general sense, I think that's, that's true. Let, let's uh, use a mic microphone. On our on artificial no it's not on it's, not. it's on here it's not. at the backboard it might not be on <clears throat>
to get it. Is it? Go ahead. Yeah. On artificial intelligence, it's a souped up computer. So I was watching my grandchildren last week. One's one and a half, one's three. They're playing in a sandbox. And that's good, you're coming through. Playing in a sandbox, but when you turn it, when you not have a, a job for a computer to do, it sits and idles its motor, so to speak. Children. Children have the ability to have creative play even at one and a half or younger, and they didn't have to have anybody teach them. That's way higher than any artificial intelligence. It cannot play. It cannot, does not have self-awareness. Animals don't have self-awareness. Put a, put a mirror up and they, yeah. they're going to fight with it. And that's all. We're along. It is, it's a misnomer at best. It's a supercomputer. Yeah. And uh, my dad played checkers. He was a checker champion. On his shelf, there were books. And all it was was, in this situation, where the checkers are here, this is what you do. It's always black to move and win. But it was a predetermined, based on all the games, and he had just had to remember that. And that's why the computer finally could beat the world-renowned chess players because every move they made in the future that will be held against them. And there's, there's a finite number of moves, but it can't beat them on their own. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, so so what, what has been done is really an illusion um, that, that sort of suggests that it's at a higher, much higher advanced level than it really really is. That, that stuff is still, still a ways out might be achievable, right? If God, uh, the, with the Tower of Babel, it says um, that, you know, so if, if as one people speaking one language working together, right, they were able to accomplish this, nothing would be impossible for them. So you can imagine that, yeah, if you just, God just let it, we might do all kinds of things because we have the creative power of God um, that he's given, the, the, the power that he has given us, we have. Um, and, and that, that can do a lot, but um, but it's part of a setup, right? It's part of a deception, um, and part of sort of a I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of counter information. Who's who's sort of the flat Earth? Anybody think the Earth's flat here? Like there's a bunch of sensible people here. Um, but a lot of people have been led to believe. And a lot of believers have been led to believe that the Earth is flat. Well, it is all Pythagoras. What's that? It is all Pythagoras. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, but but why? Well, so as an engineer, I've looked up some of this stuff. There's some really convincing, good stuff out there, but it's all fake. So it's it's. Um, has anybody ever seen an M.C. Escher picture? He's this illusionist artist that would draw uh, like it's a piece of paper, and then it becomes a hand and or guys walking on stairs that are upside down. There's just, you know, um, things that go in a circle that keep walking upstairs, but somehow arrive right back to the same place. It's just kind of neat. They're impossible things, but they make it look real. Um, and, you know, just by some, some tricks, tricks of optical illusion. Um, but, there, but what that means is there's a very elaborate sort of counter information efforts that are out there. Um, I think it's probably a calling card by somebody who wanted to show that, hey, look, um, we can make people believe anything you want, and we'll show you, you know, demonstrate some of our skills by making people think that the Earth is flat. Um, I don't know if that's right, but, but that's what, what I see, because to create, to, you have to have, you know, smart engineer type people working to create that fake information. And, you know, most people don't do that stuff for free. So somebody probably paid for that. So when you're, we're in this world of disinformation. There's a, a, a concerted effort to deceive people on a number of different topics for, you know, agendas that you might guess at or you might not be able to guess at. Um, but it is happening. Um, and there seems to be a lot of effort to go to try to make artificial intelligence look like it's much more advanced than it really is. And, and I don't know what that's setting people up for, but yeah, I, I think there's still a way out. 
Uh, speaking of that, Fern just brought a thought to mind, algorithms. Has ever, anybody heard that term, algorithms? Uh, if you trade stocks, bonds, grain futures, any kind of futures, uh, we're now hearing the algorithms will determine where you enter and where you exit your trade. Uh, what they're trying to say is we don't really need people with a brain anymore because these programs will take care of it. I can tell you from my experience that doesn't work. <laughs> so uh, we still have to have somebody that is putting in more of the factors, all of the factors involved in a buy or a sell order, that type of thing. Uh, kind of relates to what Alan was saying. The algorithm is based on nanoseconds and uh, the trades are instantaneous and it's already programmed, but man, you can lose your shirt. True. Uh, okay, another question. Well, I was just just on, just, just on the algorithms that you were talking about. Just on the algorithms, uh, in, in medicine we have algorithms as well we follow to try to make sure that we have a good outcome. If a person's having a heart attack, what are we going to do first? Well, we're going to make sure that they're breathing. <laughs> you know, we go through those ABCs, and then that's the part of our algorithm. And so then we switch over. Okay, if the if we look at the EKG, okay, this what we, the, the heart looks like over here, or do we go over here? So we have lots of algorithms too. But that doesn't necessarily mean they always work because sometimes we're not getting the right information. Maybe. The, the monitor is not wired right or hooked up right, so you try to follow it, but it's not guaranteed. Good point. He does not give judgment. <laughs> so I have kind of a different question um, related to uh, being prepared for the end times. I think um, there are many passages um, talking about uh, the Antichrist and saying how, you know, there will be many antichrists as well, but um, I think of even as you were talking about in Matthew 24 about the budding of the fig tree that um, uh, there's this idea, you know, and, and the virgins and the lamps, how we need to be prepared for the bridegroom to come. Um, but I also think there's a lot of warnings um, in scripture about not being led astray by um, by certain things that may seem like uh, Jesus' second coming or may seem um, like something we should pay attention to. Um, uh, in, in Matthew 24, it talks about how, you know, people will be saying to you, look here, look there. Mm -hmm. And um, many will be led astray by that. Um, but it says that Jesus' second coming will also be like a strike, like a lightning strike in the sky. It will be, it will be clear when that happens. So I guess how, um, how um, can we be prepared in a way that's not just running after everything we see, but um, taking things as they come as well and being being prepared for, for Christ's true second coming. Yeah, no, it's a good question. And, and I think it's, we have to know the scriptures. Um, there, there were times that, several times that Jesus said, no, you err because you don't know the scriptures when he was talking to the Pharisees, right? Or the power of God. Um, and so, well, why was that? Well, it's not really that they didn't know the scriptures, but they they didn't understand the scriptures, or they didn't believe the scriptures. Um, and so I think the, the, the best guide is knowing um, what Jesus has really said to, to watch for, because they're, they're very specific, actually. There's a lot of really detailed things um, that were given that we just don't always know and aren't always... Um, I don't know, I, th I think a, a lot of the stuff that's happened isn't universally sort of certified. Um, it's, it's not always trumpeted that, hey, something happened 
um, that's significant that we should know here's a fulfillment. Um, so the book, uh, even like with Israel, there's a lot of things in there um, that are very specific to fulfillments that I think people don't know, but I, I think if you read it, you'll go, oh, it says that, and yep, that's what happened. Oh yeah, I agree, that that is a fulfillment. But I'd never heard that one before. Um, and and those are important for two, two reasons. To, to, why do we look at all these prophecies that have been fulfilled already, and why is it important to recognize them? Um, because when you, the more fulfilled prophecies you study, the more prepared your mind is to recognize a new fulfillment that hasn't happened yet. But otherwise, we, we tend to have like an imagination of how something will be fulfilled and what it should look like and, and how we should recognize it, how many other people need to recognize it before we recognize it, um, instead of just going, oh, wait a sec. Okay, I saw all these other ones that have happened and I've connected those. And so now on my own, because I've trained myself to read and understand those, then you know, you don't need someone to tell you that it was fulfilled because you know the prophecy, you saw what happened, and you go, it, it would be like watching a football game. Do you, do you need to know someone to tell you if it went between the goalposts and whether that was a, uh, you know, an extra point or not? Like, yeah, you want to see the ref call it, but you're like, no, I saw it. I went through the uprights. That was good. Right? I don't need someone to tell me that. Um, so it's, it's kind of you know, training ourselves so that we can make those calls ourselves. That's part of getting to maturity is, is you've got to stand in faith. And you can't stand in faith um, very well on something that you're just trusting somebody else's opinion. But you can go, no, I trust God's word. I saw it. I can connect those things. Those start becoming hills that, that you're willing to die on. Because you yourself have seen it connected. And so that's what a lot of what I'm trying to do with the book is to connect so that um, it's, it's no longer really a matter. It's, it's an objective sort of, yep, that's what it says. This is what happened. I can make those connections. When people don't know, right, then it's much easier to suggest something. And you don't know the, the scripture passage that tells you that, wait a minute, no. When someone tells you go into the inner room, don't believe them. Right? When they say go out and he's somewhere in the desert, you know, no, don't go out to him because that's not how I'm coming. Right? There's that warning, but, but someone who doesn't know those verses, hey, look, Jesus came back and he's over here in Korea. Uh, you know, there's 19 people right now that I found that are claiming to be the Messiah or Jesus Christ or a new Jesus Christ in the world today, all over the, all over the world. So it's, you know, we're definitely in a time... And, and that's kind of an amazing thing for a, a carpenter from Nazareth to say, many are going to come in my name declaring that I am he. 2,000 years ago to say that? Like, what? I mean, how many other carpenters in Nazareth or Israel or, you know, Zimbabwe, um, people are running around claiming to be them? I mean, how many people are even claiming, around, claiming to be Buddha? Even though there's a, you know, there's... A billion people or more who think, you know, Buddha's real. Jesus said it, and it's, we see it's, it's true. Um, so, I, I think that's the best way. You just have to know the scripture, right? You, you study it, that's how you, you can answer people who are trying to tell you, oh no, it's this. Um, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, who, who teaches us all things that we can then, you know, where does discernment come from? Um, you know, another thing that, that I'll tell you, like, how did, how did I come up with some of these things that are, are coming up? I mean, I, I don't know, it's the grace of God. I, I did grow up in a home that studied the Bible from a young age. Um, and I also, James says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. But when he, when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave blown and tossed by the sea. He's a... Um, double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, and he should not expect to receive anything um, from God. I've prayed that since I was my boy's age back there. And just, you know, Lord, I, I can't figure this out without you. I need your wisdom. And I believe that he would, he would give it to me. And it wasn't a prayer I prayed once. You know, it's, it's not a one-time ask. It's a, 
ask that we ask over and over and over again. And I'm sure many of you know that verse and you've prayed the same thing. Um, and I would say that, that God answers that prayer. And, um, and we've got to keep asking that, especially in these days, because it is a time of deception. It says the deception would be so great so as to deceive even the elect if that were possible. So that means it's going to be good. And, and I'll say one other thing that's happened in these days. I always thought it was going to be like one really good lie. That people were going to, you know, how the Antichrist would deceive them that he was, you know, he was indeed God. Or, you know, maybe he would be. But now I think, no, it's like there, there will be some very big lies. But somehow it's actually lies everywhere. It's the whole worldview. It's, it's the, there was a, a trick um, that David Copperfield did once. And he brought people on stage and he shows them, you know, the, the uh, Statue of Liberty. And then he puts a big uh, curtain over the back of the, of the stage. And he goes and he's performing tricks. And, you know, after a while he turn's around and he drops the curtain and the Statue of Liberty's gone. Does anybody know that, that trick? And anybody know how he did it? You read the book, so you know. All right, <clears throat> but it, he's on. A, he had everybody on a rotary stage, and so the whole time he's distracting them, they're all turning. And so then when he drops the well, <laughs> Statue of is right behind him. <laughs> you know, and if they just turned around in their chairs, they would have seen it. And then he puts the curtain back, and you know, distracts him for a while. Turns around, oh, now the Statue of Liberty is back. But he he turned the whole world. On them, right? Everything changed. And, and what's happening now is people are being fed an entire comprehensive worldview that is going to be at odds with a biblical explanation of these last days. And they're going to start having answers of ways to rationalize in their mind a way the obvious that, you know, God is beginning his judgment on the world and all these things are happening according to prophecy. And then, no, no, it's just. It's climate change, right? Um, which I came up last time. I mean, like we talk about one of the, the, the only other bigger farce is that, that nothing created everything and that everything evolved from, you know, a big bang. Just as ridiculous as saying carbon is affecting climate change and that's, and it's man's, you know, we've got too many cars and too many cows and that's destroying the planet. I asked somebody, some guys this last night, but who, who knows what percentage CO2 is of the atmosphere? 0 0.025, I don't know. Yeah, like, it's like, it's like point, you're right, it's like 0.04%. And I'm not a climate scientist, but I'm a mechanical engineer, we do heat transfer, we, you know. That it's like if you're talking about heating up the planet, it's a heat capacity problem. You have to have something to hold more heat. Because for, for a certain volume of water, air, whatever, it only goes up in temperature as it holds more energy. So if you want it to hold more heat, just, you know, that you want to change the heat capacity of the atmosphere, you have to change its composition or you have to change its density. So if I have more dense air, if I increased the standard air pressure, you could, have, you could hold more energy, you could hold more heat, um, or you could change the, the type of gas that's in the, but changing from 0.04% to 0.05%, and now suddenly I've radically changed the heat capacity of the atmosphere, I, I just find a ridiculous idea. I'll go one better. Nitrogen is 78% of the air. It's now pollutant, and you got to shut down. You got to shut down the, the agriculture in, in the Netherlands and other places because they're giving off poisonous nitrogen. Right. Also, Th these are just the the ridiculous ideas. They they're not even saying, but they're being proposed by some of the supposedly smartest people in the world. All right. These awesome climate scientist guys who are just trying to save us and save the planet. Um, and and it's, a, it's a huge lie, but it's 
it's being bought, right? Why? Because this is a time of deception, I think, that was promised. And we're losing our ability to tell truth. We're already in a postmodern world where truth doesn't exist. Um, but I can say absolutely that there is no truth. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Uh, otherwise, we're just ready for it. Okay, here's one. You just hold it closer and you're fine. To his point about the AI, um, I somewhat agree with him. Uh, the, the computers and the AI do not have the like human-like mind capacity, but um, um, they did with uh, medications. They went back with those algorithms and um, they thought, sifted through all the research and all the experiments that these people did over 50, 60 years later, and they said, well, what would it take to make a drug that would do this, for this condition? And they have done that. So they are kind of thinking in a, in a way. Yeah, and so when, when you talk about the ability to look at big data sets and to make sense of it, they, they do have an amazing capacity to, to do that over time with these training algorithms. And um, they actually that we can do. Yeah, and, and so there there is some there's a, the ability to make associations, mm -hmm. yeah, and and so that that's not that like this um, the 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 translation that we did in Spanish that's an AI generator and it did an awesome job of a of an initial base translation of my book into Spanish. That's amazing. That's not a trivial. That normally would have been only something a person could do, right? You you couldn't have an A. You couldn't have this automatic translation program for complex sentences um, in a no one language to another and, and be expected to be right. Uh, I did have a question too, if I could um, kind of bring us back to the here and now. Um, one of the points you made was about totalitarianism. And our media tells us that it's going to come from the right. Some of us have a sneaking suspicion it's going to come from the left. but. Uh, the history of totalitarianism says it's actually going to come from the center where people actually call for some strong figure. And there might be some people, like maybe people in this room, that say, no, but then we're going to be the outcasts or the pariahs. Right. Uh, what, do you, what's your thoughts yeah. on no, that? No, I, I think you, you somehow you, to capture everybody. Right, or, or to get the consent of the government in, in some submissive form. Um, when we look at Germany, I read a really interesting book, um, and you'll notice I, I don't really generally cite uh, people's books for, for things, because I, um, not that there aren't great books out there, but I think one of the places you wanna find truth first is in the word, and then you, know, you, you wanna add, add on to that, and that, that develops our, uh, our discernment. But there was a, a great book written um, called When Money Dies. And I forget the, the author. But it was, it was just a historical look at, at the, uh, what happened in Germany after World War I and before World War II as the mark went from one mark buys, a, one German mark buys an egg to, you know, I, I don't know, a billion marks by an egg. I don't remember what the final, um, but it just, and, and that whole time, what happened is they kept printing more money, and then the, the allies would um, devalue the currency because they had inflated it, and so then they'd have to pay them more, but they would go, well, the, the allies just, uh, you know, devalued our currency, so we have to print more money. Instead of they devalued it because we printed money, they go, we're going to print money because they devalued our currency, right? Just flip it on its head. So they just kept running the printing presses over and over. And, and the very thing that they were doing was what was causing the problem, right? And they just, you know, drove it right into the ditch. Um, and that created so much turmoil and so much angst for the people that when somebody came along and said, hey, I'm going to fix that, they did. They turned to... A strong man 
to save them from. So the first part was driving it into the ditch. And then when they go to build back better, that's when the build back better is the, oh, but by the way, to get it better, you're going to have to give up a few things. Let's take maybe one more question and then we need to take a break. So if somebody has one more question. Yeah, we'll, but otherwise we'll, we'll keep going with this. I'll have a lot more to share. This will give you guys if you, somebody needs the, so, so needs the rest of the, the Yep. Give us four things. To be prepared, um, can I save that question? Because I think um, that will, it'll go better on a little bit more information that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna give you. But I, I think that's an awesome question because we need to come out of this with, all right, what does that mean? Where do we go from here? But let me share some more, share, let me share some, and then if I don't, don't let me forget, because I might, but, but I, I think that's a, a great question to, to leave you guys with some good information for that, or some good thoughts, right? I can't tell you what you need to do um, specifically, but I can tell you four things that I think you should be thinking about. Glenn has one question here, and then, then we're going to... Okay, yep, no problem. For, for today, I was thankful and answer a prayer that the, <laughs> the electronics started working better. Yes. I like that, but, but it also reminded me of that uh, if we depend on electronics, that it could disappear. But if we're staying in the Word of God, we can have answers, and that's I think what it's getting at. And it, you know, when <clears throat> when I said to myself, "Okay, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you're getting to the Book of Jude, but uh, this is just something that came to my heart." Uh, it said, uh, "But you, beloved, remember the words." spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk after their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the spirit. But you beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal life. And it goes on to say, have compassion and <clears throat> making a difference. But others safe with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating the garment defiled by the flame. Uh, now, as able, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. There are a couple of things right, right from the word. How can we stay prepared? Uh, pray and keep yourself in the love of God. That that'd be too. Yeah. But but I, I you know being yeah. being, a, being a technology 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 man and, and an inventor. Uh, when uh, when you have that much information at your finger, fingertips all the time, and then it, then it could change or it could <clears throat> disappear. It seems like we could be led astray. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, now let's, uh, we'll just take a break because uh, we need a little bit to get up around and whatever, but let's, it's uh, 9.45, I think. So let's say uh, we will be back here uh, at, uh, be back here at, say, 5 after 10. A lot of work, that's 20 minutes. Amen. So 5 after 10, we'll be here and we'll uh, do the next session. So thanks.